everyone, it's Annie and welcome to the channel. Today I wanted to talk to you guys about the Alpine ILX 507. We got these in a couple months ago and now that I've really gotten to know it, I wanted to make a video review to kind of go over all the nitty gritty details. I gotta tell you, this thing has been a really hot seller, very popular among clients because it's a great value. It gives you so many features for the money. The biggest attraction is the wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto combined with IdataLink Maestro compatibility and an HD screen. Yet this has so many more features besides that. We've got a 13 band parametric EQ adjustable per channel, multiple crossover point settings, HD FM AM radio, Sirius XM compatibility, and two camera inputs. Now this has always been a stickler for me with Alpine most of their previous Maestro compatible models, such as the ILX 207, the Halo units, the F309, F409, and F411, all had just one camera input. And if you wanted to do more than one camera, you had to buy Alpine's proprietary cameras, the HCEC 2100RD and HCEC 2600FD, along with their switcher module, which I think was an HCX 2600B, which adds up to a lot of parts just to add two cameras to a nice aftermarket head unit. It was great to see that they added these two composite camera inputs, especially considering that their basic entry-level CarPlay unit for $399 has two composite camera inputs. So why wouldn't their higher-end models have two camera inputs, right? Right? Anyways, I was really glad to see that they've added the two camera inputs to this model. However, I have learned with Alpine over these years, there's always a catch. And I'm gonna tell you what that catch is in this review. Let's keep watching. Looking at the backside of this unit, I mentioned we have HDMI input and output, and then all of our camera connections and RCA connections are all done via pigtails. The USBs are direct off of the back of the unit, and you've got two USB ports. Your main USB for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto is actually a 2.4 amp charging port, which is awesome. It's a really nice feature to have, so you have that fast charge, and then it's a 1.5 amp on the secondary USB. Now that secondary USB is for future expansion or for secondary devices with music on like a thumb drive. But down the road, Alpine will have an optional GPS navigation available for this, which is great. This way you're not stuck with the unit. If you find yourself in a situation where you're traveling outside of cell service and you want that satellite nav, that will be available as an add-on that simply plugs into that secondary USB port. Originally, we're hoping to have that product available by summer of 2022, but it's been delayed. So hopefully we see that in the next coming months. One of the things I often get asked about is startup time and boot up time. So I'm going to go ahead and kill power right now. And I'm gonna turn it back on. Right now you can see when those lights flash that the power has been put back on. And we'll see how long it takes for the unit to actually boot up. and let's see how long it takes to connect to my wireless CarPlay. Pretty quick, not bad. The first thing that stuck out to me was how improved the screen quality was. This is considered an HD screen and it definitely shows compared to previous models. Set up wireless Apple CarPlay. That setup's actually pretty easy. We just go into setup, device list, and then we can add new device and I have my iPhone connected wirelessly right now. One thing to note, if you do want to use the wireless feature, which why wouldn't you want to use it? You do have to have the GPS connected and uh, just keep that in mind. Otherwise you cannot do wireless connection. I don't know if that's the same for Android, but I know that is the case for Apple. Although this unit has an FM AM HD radio, one thing that kind of drives me bonkers is how they do these scrolling presets. I'm much more a fan of fixed presets on the bottom. I think that's just a little bit easier to use while you're driving because not every vehicle is gonna have preset control on the steering wheel. And this font, it's kind of small, just you know, being a little picky here, not a fan of the scrolling presets. Talking about scrolling presets and things that I'm not a fan of, this head unit screen is not quite as responsive as I expected it to be. In fact, I think it's a little less responsive than the ILX W650 and the ILX 407, which is like crazy. But 
For example, let's say I want to go into that awesome EQ. Um, actually, I went to the wrong spot, but to go into the EQ, you have to tap this, which usually takes me a couple taps, maybe more than a couple. There we go. All right. So now I'm into the EQ and it's interesting because it's not every part of the screen that has that kind of lag or unresponsiveness, like the subwoofer level control. That's pretty responsive right there. So I'm in the advanced EQ and I should be able to tap each of these bands. I know it looks like you're not supposed to be able to, but you do. You, and this is the same for the i509 WRA JL. I have a client that has one of those. And I had to go in there the other day and preset her, redo her EQ, because we have to do update and reset everything. And I was tapping this for the longest time. You Luckily, you can hit the band button and just jump over. But I did some shots earlier showing that, yes, you should be able to actually select this and then turn the level up or down to your choosing. Focus on using the band button, which is super responsive. So again, certain areas of the screen seem more responsive than others. I, I don't really understand that. Look at this control that we have. We have a 13 band parametric EQ that's adjustable per channel. Alpine's pitching this as having a digital sound processor in the head unit, which it really is. It, you know, you have a, so much control here. Even in the crossover setting, you've got adjustments for front, rear, and subwoofer. Tons of different frequency choices, starting, I believe, as low as 25 hertz. Yeah, 25, all the way up to 250. And you have your slope adjustment all the way up to 24 dB per octave. And then you also have a level adjustment too here. This goes down to minus 12. There's a ton of adjustment within the EQ. So for that, I love it. I love all the audio control. And then even in the time correction setting, you have the option to do your setting either via milliseconds, centimeters, or inches, which I like because, you know, depends on your flavor and what you're used to when you're setting up these parameters. For people that are not using for that, you do still have that basic EQ that was on the first page. For example of just the weird responsiveness. This part right here is really responsive, but other parts of the screen are not quite as responsive. And if I tap this button right here, then I have my, my separate, my easy control right here. So for bass treble, balance fader, tone control, basically just a quick tap of that button will get you to that screen. But that's an example of something that I think it worked that time. Sometimes I have to hit it a few times to actually get it to respond, which is weird. Now, this does have HDMI input, which is cool. A lot of clients like to sit and watch YouTube movies, whatever, when they're in park. So I have my little Apple HDMI adapter connected. I also have my CarPlay connected wirelessly, which can present an issue. I got my phone here, I'm gonna connect it the HDMI. I'm going to attempt to just play something on YouTube. I have it starting to stream from my phone. I'm going to select the HDMI input here and look how it freezes. That is because you really can't do Apple CarPlay and HDMI at the same time. I'm told by Alpine if you want to use wireless connection for Apple CarPlay you have to go into the device menu Disconnect. Now let me go back to HDMI and now it's playing. Just keep that in mind if you do want to use the HDMI input and you want to use wireless Apple CarPlay, <laughs> you do have to turn off or disconnect basically your CarPlay connection. So all right, so let's see how easy it is to get back to CarPlay. Let me go back to my device menu hit oh it says disconnect did i disconnect the wrong thing i guess i'm going to disconnect again connect carplay i'll disconnect the hdmi yeah carplay just popped up on my phone doo -doo. cool i don't know i must have accidentally disconnected the knob too i don't remember doing that which leads me to the next super cool feature. One of the biggest complaints I've gotten from clients about all of these touchscreen units is that they don't have a volume knob. Volume knobs 
I don't know why they just, you know, they haven't been really part of the touchscreen category. I think it has to do with the parameters of what Apple CarPlay and Android Auto will operate in. I remember in the beginning, there were a couple of Kenwood models that would support Apple CarPlay and they had a volume knob, but they wouldn't support Android Auto. So I think everybody moved to the seven inch screens. And now you don't have to be without a knob. Ta -da! So this little guy is still not connected. Connect. There we go. Is a volume knob. But if you push it in, it's also a subwoofer control knob. How cool is that? I think that's exciting. And this just has like a regular little watch battery, like a 2032 or 2025, something like that. And you could mount this somewhere in your car. It's got a couple of screws back here. Or you could, you know, double sided stick tape it somewhere and just remove it when you change the battery which some people might think that's not very convenient but uh, honestly the Parrot MKI 9200 worked like that for years that was what we used to add Bluetooth audio and hands-free calling to vehicles and they had a very similar design for the knob and it was uh, it was a hit it was very intuitive clients knew that they had to take it off once a year to to change the battery but they had a neat little sliding mechanism so you could just slide it off you know, honestly, I didn't look at the hardware bag to see if it came with anything like that. Let me check it out and see if it does. Yeah, unfortunately, nothing like that in the hardware. This is more for if you're going to be using it with uh, one of the Halo screens. You can basically mount this to the backside of one of the 9-inch or 11-inch screens, but nothing to kind of easily stick that and peel it off the dash. Just some good double-sided 3M stick tape, perhaps. So the Halo knob is cool. I'm a fan. Besides a ton of audio settings, this head unit has just a ton of regular settings. I mean, like settings for days. You could just get lost in the different options and menus. If I go into the different functions for both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, you have all these different adjustments right here. If we were going into radio, we have some adjustments here. Basically, we have like a volume offset adjustment for each of these sources, which is nice because, you know, with our super compressed Sirius XM, we might need to bump that up so that there's not a huge gap between your Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, and Sirius XM sources. There's also different options if you have, you know, the Maestro set up, you'll be able to get into vehicle information, vehicle settings. In terms of personalizing this particular model, you can change the background color, but you can't actually upload your own 
image, but they do give you a couple different background colors to pick from. You also cannot change these blue buttons on the bottom. Those will always light up that alpine blue. And one thing I like is you can turn this key sound feedback on or off. Yeah, that kind of sound. Some people like that key sound feedback. I dislike it, so I turn it off. But these are all things you can adjust. The other really important thing to keep in mind about this head unit is it does support high-res audio. I have found very few clients that are actually utilizing apps that support high-res audio, such as Amazon HD, Tidal, or Apple Music. Most people, even if they are using apps like Apple Music, they don't have those high-resolution audio settings turned on on their phone. I do try to take the time to chat with clients about that, but if you're just you know, streaming Spotify or Pandora, you're not gonna really get the benefit of that high-res capability. That is a pretty awesome feature that this head unit is at least capable of those high-resolution files. Camera control, which is cool. One of the cool things I like about this is this mute while backing up. That's something that parents like for new drivers, just helps kids focus for a second, put it in reverse, mute the audio, kind of a nice feature. Check this out. Even though this is Maestro compatible, and I don't think Maestro supports advanced camera control features such as automatic front camera control, meaning you can trigger the front camera for like seven seconds after shifting from reverse to drive, Alpine does not support that. And I learned that when I had a client who had a 2017 Subaru Forester it had a pretty basic stock stereo, then the client had a factory reverse camera, steering wheel control, so we used the Maestro to retain that stuff. And he was like, yeah, while, while you're in there, let's add a front camera. And then I learned the other thing about the front camera that kind of drove me nuts. Let me show you. So Alpine has this pigtail that comes off the back of the head unit for your rear camera control. This is also where you have an IdataLink connection, so as rear camera. This is where you could hook up their optional dash DVR camera but you can clearly say these, these are labeled front camera and rear camera. And they also include one of these little adapters, which basically goes from their proprietary camera connection to a composite, which is what we needed for the Datalink Maestro to retain it in that Subaru. However, to add the front camera, we needed another one of these adapters because the client didn't want to go with a high resolution front camera and then just still have kind of the crummy stock backup camera, yet he didn't really want to change both cameras, you know, he just wanted to add a basic front camera. So it just kind of peeves me that Alpine doesn't include one of these or make it super clear that additional parts required if you want to use a composite camera set up specifically for Alpine specific cameras. So keep that in mind. If you just want to add like a basic analog front camera, non-Alpine brand, you're going to have to buy another one of these from PACparts.com, which is Alpine's parts distributor. I want to say it's around eight bucks plus shipping. But let's say you do just a generic camera. You're, you're gonna have to manually tap the camera button to switch between front and rear. And what I have connected right now is a couple cameras. I have the Alpine HCEC 2100RD, which is gonna give us multiple viewing options on the screen, which is kind of nice. So if I tap the view button, I can do panoramic, I can do corner, and I can do a top view. So having the multiple views in the one camera and the control on the screen, I think is pretty cool. And then I was like, hey, I wonder how that Alpine camera compares to the riding camera that we installed for the front camera and that Subaru. So I hooked up one of those too. And I didn't bother with the lines, but let me select the riding camera. This is the riding hd4 i think is the part number that's the riding camera kind of a little better picture quality i think better color maybe let's go back to the alpine definitely different coloring interesting not as uh saturated Just an interesting thing. And then I was like, you know what? I wonder how that compares to Kenwood's high res. So I hooked one up 
to this guy. That one's really sharp. So that's the writing and the Kenwood CMOS 740 HD. And that's the Alpine's HD camera with multi-view. And these are both high-res screens. So it kind of gives you an interesting comparison to the camera quality, right? Overall, I think the Alpine ILX 507 is an awesome buy. They really have packed in as many features as they could possibly get into this head unit at a great price point. I really can't complain too much, even though I always find something to complain about. What do you guys think of the Alpine ILX 507? Have you installed one in your car yet? Let me know in the comments below. And if you're curious about how Alpine does with an oscilloscope test on the preamp voltage, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications. That'll be my next video. Thank you so much for watching guys. We'll see you next time.